David Shields. I've been threatening you for a long time that I'm going to have you on Jazz Piano Skills, and I've made good on my threat. Here we are. <laughs> you have, and I'm, I'm, I'm trembling. No, this is, uh, no, this is, this is going to be good fun. <laughs> yes, it is going to be fun, man, because, you know, I've known you now. You joined Jazz Piano Skills, uh, well, I, I guess, what, maybe a couple years ago now? Has it been that long? A couple of years, yeah. 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 So, you uh, know, and we've, probably, we've got to yeah, know just on two other, years. Know each other. Two years, yeah. So we've got to know each other back and forth yeah. uh, over those two years' time. And uh, I'm fascinated with just how much you know about jazz. You're like a walking encyclopedia of jazz. And <laughs> I'm also fascinated because you are a professional athlete and trainer, uh, a tennis coach. And, uh, and I want to talk about all that stuff uh, today as well in relationship to jazz studies. But before we before we get off to the races here, I want to just kind of turn the microphone over to you, and I want you to share and introduce yourself to the Jazz Panel Skills community. Man, tell us about your childhood, your background, how you got into music, how you got into this love of jazz that you have. Uh, so just the mic is mm -hmm. yours, my friend. Just fill fill us in. Uh, and we've only got uh, three days to do this. <laughs> <laughs> well, we can make it four. We can make it four. Uh, well, I, seriously, I, I feel a bit of a, a, a ring in here. I'm, I feel like I've jumped the queue in front of a whole lot of others who, uh, and the other interviews you've done with professional musicians and Jamie Abersold, and, you know, how do I compare with that? That's, that's impossible. Um, but it, it's a real treat to be on here and be able to talk with you. Uh, I started a uh, long, 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 long time ago playing piano, had a piano in the house, grew up in the middle of Kansas, and there was always music around there. Uh, I, I listened to everything my mother had. I've still got her, her 78 albums of Benny Goodman, Glenn Miller, Tommy Dorsey. We, we grew up with that music, Frank Sinatra, show tunes. So there was always music in the house and there was always something around. And the piano was a, a huge part of what, what we did. My sisters and I both took lessons. I think I had the better teacher, but she, <laughs> I don't know why, they, why we got split up. But uh, no, I had a brilliant teacher when I, was, when I was growing up to the point that I was playing mostly classical, almost all classical at that point. But to learn things that really made a big impact on, on my music life and, and what I've done since then. Um, things like, you know, learning the Chopin military polonaise when I was, I was 11 years old. And I wow. still play it. I, I, it's wow. something that uh, I, I don't know. But what I have learned from you, and this is really, really important, is that's only pushing buttons. <laughs> that's all it is. <clears throat> and what I've learned from you in the last two years yeah. about the difference in learning music or actually playing music and understanding it, my mind, my head is just exploding every week. And <laughs> you've Good. got to understand that you have given us over two years. I've got about 2000 pages of, of lesson notes from you. There's no, I don't have enough time left in the world to learn all this stuff, but that's, um, it's really, really important. Um, and I went on and I played piano for a long time and then went to, went to college, kept playing. Uh, and I suppose growing up, I was, I was asked to play things in school concerts or, or a lot of recitals and things. And, mm -hmm. and, and that just kept me going, but went to college and then went into the army and I was, I was introduced to Jay McShann when I was in the Army. Now, my yeah, mother introduced right. me to him. This isn't just she played me his music and, and that she actually introduced me to him. Uh, I was oh, home wow. on leave one weekend. This was in probably February 1973, I think. And 
My parents picked me up. We drove to Wichita and went to the Canterbury Inn in Wichita. She said, I've got, I've got to introduce you to somebody. Walked in there, and here's Jay McShann sitting at the piano with Paul Gunther in the corner playing <laughs> drums and Claude Williams on the bass and the violin. Oh, my gosh. Now, I, I'm hoping everyone knows who Jay McShann is and was uh, as, as one of the great Kansas City blues pianists had his own big band. He was instrumental in getting Charlie Parker his first start. It took him, you know, part, Charlie worked with Jay for years and years, and then uh, they both went to New York and they, they changed directions. But uh, they, to sit in that little club right next to him and watch him play and to listen to Claude Williams, who, and I remember, um, wow, who was it, Bert, uh, Bert talked about one of your other interviews, talked about meeting Claude and playing with Claude Williams. Bert Ligon. Just incredible. Right. Um, to, to be a part of that and part of that history is, was, was really something. I've got a couple other Jay McShann stories I'll, I'll tell you there. They both have bittersweet endings, but they're, they're, <laughs> they are good. Uh, but from there, went, uh, went back, to, back to college, still playing tennis all the time, teaching. Started teaching tennis in 1975, I think. So I've been been teaching about 47 years now. Pretty much full time around the world, and uh, and it just it just went on from there. Was offered a chance. Was working at a tennis club in 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 Florida with with Harry Hopman, and there was a French family who came through. One of the young, one of their sons was was playing. Went out to dinner with them one night. They said, would you come and be Pierre's private coach in, in Lyon? So I went to France for four years and played, wow. uh, taught wow. there and, and played, but still kept playing piano. I, had a, I found a teacher there who was a friend of, of the, the families there. The most amazing teacher I've ever had. Uh, French, oh, except for you. But... Um, <laughs> <laughs> Okay. She thank you, was thank you. an amazing teacher to, to the point that I would go in there for my lesson on Sunday afternoons, 45 minute lesson. And almost every week she would say, oh, that's pretty good. But let's stay, stay, have dinner with the family and then we'll go back and play some more. So we wow. did. She asked me to play things that I had no business playing. I've got a, an autographed copy of she sent me a, a copy of uh, Chopin's uh Polonaise fantasy that is just mind-boggling. Right. But one year, for my, it happened, it happened on my birthday, one year she invited her teacher, Madeleine de Valmalet, to the house. And Madame de Valmalet came in and played a concert for us, all the Chopin wow. preludes, start to finish, oh from memory. Gosh. She was 86 years old at the time. Oh, my goodness. And... We just sat there and listened to that. And I was doing some research the, oh, a few months ago just to see where, what her history was. It turns out, and now Amy and Nancy and Anita will enjoy this. The finger exercise in independence is uh, Isadora Philip, who wrote two volumes of, of finger independence. Yeah. Absolutely incredible, uh, much better than Hannon and Cherney and all of those. But Madame de Valmolette was a student of Isidore Philip in Paris at the conservatory. So this is where I go back to the history of mm -hmm. the, you know, the, the, the generations and the connections right. that I've had with, with the piano. Right. And it's, but it's all, it's all classical right now mm -hmm. up to that point. So this is where I'm on my journey now with you and, and with working on jazz. Um, and that's... Yeah. Playing jazz is, is one thing. I've been involved with it for a long time. I've been doing radio work in Melbourne for about 20 years, right. um, producing and presenting jazz programs. So that's where I get a lot of uh, contact with the musicians, um, emceeing jazz festivals and you know, album launches and, and interviews right. and all of that. Right. That's why I say I'm, I feel like I'm on the wrong side of the mic here because I'm, I'm so used to interviewing people instead of being interviewed. So I, I don't get to talk as much. Right. 
But the, right. the people right. I've met, and one of your, your great sayings, and, and you do it all the time, the, the greatest thing about music is, is the people you meet. And oh, I absolutely right. agree with that. And it's, it's true with tennis as well. Uh, I've met some amazing yeah, people through, right. through tennis traveling around the world. Right. But the music, right. the people that I've met through interviews and concerts and listening, to, right. to sit down and talk with Charlie Hayden or yeah, sit and right. talk with right. uh, Lee Konitz right. or Jack D. Jeanette, oh, my goodness. to be able to, to sit and talk with these people and find out mm -hmm. you know, what's what's it like why do you why do you play the way you play and what you know you talked about right. in the in the master class the other day how how do you practice improvisation right. what do you do right and i was able to talk with these guys and and i asked lee Konitz one time what's what are your favorite things to play and and how do you keep playing so many things over the years right. and he said you know i only play about a dozen tunes and that's why i play all the things you are because it's infinitely Changeable. You can do anything with it, right, and to right. hear that from him, who had yes. been at right. the uh, at the birth of the cool with Miles Davis, right? That's that's incredible to Man. to listen to that and to to be able to to hear him. Uh, so, you know, I've had some some really really fortunate chances to meet people and and talk with them and just sit. Um, you know, yeah. I'll, the the two Jay McShan stories. I've, I've got to share these with you there. Please, please. The first one was um, playing a concert. He was playing at a jazz festival in Salina, Kansas, and I'd I'd caught up with him a few times. They had the break. He came over the table. We're sitting chatting, and I said, you know, it's it's really great. Some of the things that you just used to do with Charlie Parker that that was uh, was really um, groundbreaking and things that you got him to do. And he said, you know, I think I've got some old tape somewhere that uh, we might have recorded years ago. Here's my address in Kansas City. Stop by sometime and pick him up. And my jaw went. <laughs> I yeah, no could doubt. Not right. Yeah. Believe it. That yeah. was. Yeah, no doubt. That was just incredible. I, he gave me his address, wrote it on the back of a, a deposit slip out of his checkbook. <laughs> <laughs> but, oh, my. <laughs> and I think I've still got it. Oh, my gosh. Oh, that's but, hilarious. Uh, so, but I never, I never got, I was playing a tennis tournament in Kansas City one year and I, I was going to look him up and just never had a chance to do it. We did catch up a few times after that. Once in France, I was in Lyon working at a tennis club, coaching this kid and went into the local music shop. The big poster on the wall, Ella Fitzgerald playing it at this outdoor amphitheater. Mm -hmm. This is in the middle of July and summer in France, beautiful time. Ella Fitzgerald with opening act Jay McShann and the quartet. Now I was, of course, you got to see Ella, but I was really happy oh, to right. see Jay again. And there was, there was a girl at the tennis club who I was, uh, I was teaching English to this group of business people. And, and one of the people in the class, she was a big jazz fan. I said, look, you want to go see Ella Fitzgerald? Yeah, great. It's great. So off we went. And I went down. To, <laughs> we got there, got our seats. And, and then Jay and guys were warming up and, and getting set up. And I went down to the stage and just said, hi, how, how's it going? Caught up a little bit. And he said, hey, look, when we finish, we finish the set, come backstage and we'll, we'll, we'll have a chat. We'll, we'll catch up. And there's my dilemma. I'm at a concert to watch Ella Fitzgerald with with this girl who's you know, interested in Ella Fitzgerald, didn't know Jamie Chan at all. Right. So what's what's my what's my choice? What's my choice? Jay <laughs> finished his set and I and I did I did what I knew I had to do. So I, I made sure I got a, I got her a ride back to the to, no I didn't. No. <laughs> no, we sat there and and, and Right. Oh, my. We, we saw Ella. And, you know, the one one thing that strikes me most about Ella Fitzgerald was Paul Smith at the piano. Absolutely incredible. He, he only died a few years ago, but he was he was a, an absolute giant uh, and accompanied Ella for, for years. Brilliant pianist. Right, absolutely right. brilliant. 
So it was it was worth it. Now I, I did see Jay a few times after that anyway, so that's I didn't miss too much. Right. But uh, I, yeah. yeah, and I, I made the right choice. <laughs> so, you made the right choice. But you that's, made the right choice. This is the yeah. This is the mix of you know tennis and and music and and I'm so glad that I'm doing this this journey with you right now because I I love it. I absolutely love it. But it's driving me crazy. I, I, I just, there's so much to learn and it's so much more difficult. Oh, <laughs> it, right. Right. it is, it right. is so difficult compared right. to the, to the classical piano. I, you know, I'm playing, right. uh, when I was in Florida, I had a teacher there who, who forced me to do a solo concert. And she said, you're going to, you're going to play this concert. It's an hour long program. You pick whatever you want to play, but you also have to compose two pieces. And oh, okay, oh my goodness. So I did, and and it was recorded. I don't know what happened to the recording; it's gone. But one of the pieces I, I, I did a, a prelude, recorded, uh, wrote one, and then the second one, uh, very very catchy title. I called it Composition Number One, and <laughs> that right. was it. Right, uh, classic, but, <laughs> classic. Oh. <laughs> uh, but that was that. That's a sort of pushing that I've had to to play things that are, are beyond me. And and you talk about this all the time. You've you've got to go beyond your comfort level and just keep going. So now we're we're in the key of B major. Ugh, I'm I'm still, you know, it, it's it really is not that easy. But it's it's fun. It's so yes. much fun right. to be able to do right. this, right. and. Also, to know the music, that's, that's where I think I've got a slight advantage over some who, who may not, who may just be coming in learning right now. But I've, I've had right. so much contact with the right. music and with jazz musicians and, and piano and different instruments. That's, that's made a huge difference. So I can, I can feel the music and I, I, know, I know what it is and I'm, right. uh, I know I've heard it before, so right. I'll try to play it again. But that's... Uh, that's where we've ended yeah. up, but the, the crossover is incredible. I've been taking notes over the last week or so since you got a hold of me, and and just the comparisons of what I do and what you do, what I do on the court, what you do at the keyboard is is really uh, there, well, there's I, so many crossovers. Yeah, and I and, and I, yeah, and I want to talk about that a little bit, David, because you, you know obviously your musical path has been quite a journey you know from a classical background you have this profound love for jazz and the history of jazz the music of jazz and but i want to set that kind of to the side for a second because i want you to talk a little mm -hmm. bit about you know you're a professional tennis coach you know you're there in australia you've been you, you just mentioned that you've been coaching and teaching uh professional tennis uh, uh tennis for 40 40 year 40 years right and mm -hmm. um so I want you to talk a little bit about the discipline that you have uh, acquired over the years as a professional athlete, as a tennis player, and, and as a tennis coach. And I want you to talk about that a little bit in the demands of, uh, of, of being an athlete and a professional coach and how that parallels with the, the demands and the mental side that you have found that is necessary with regards to the study of music, whether it's classical or jazz, just the study of music in general. So can you, can mm -hmm. you talk to us about that a little bit? Oh, absolutely. 99% of it comes back to fundamentals. And I know you stress mm -hmm. that a lot. Uh, and I'll start with paper practice. That is, is one of the most right. important things that I've learned from you and learning to to step away from the instruments and and learn right. theory and and chords and scales and right. and everything right. that is necessary to be able to play the same thing happens right. with tennis and something that i try to get through to the students the players all the time is that you don't have to be hitting tennis balls to improve you don't have to be right. on the court so invariably right. we get a wet day the rain comes down the kids are saying, oh, you know, mm -hmm. oh, we can't do anything. And the parents are even worse sometimes. 
they're thinking, right. I'm not paying this guy to teach my kid how to play tennis if we can't hit tennis balls. But there's mm-hmm. so much that they can learn off the court. There's so much mm-hmm. that they can learn about the history, about the strategies, about mm-hmm. the, the basic things like the geometry of the court. Right. Everything I teach is really based in geometry and physics. And like we talk about in music, everything is only ascending, descending, scales and arpeggios. That's it. Right. Right. It's pretty simple. Right. Tennis is the same way. And I try to get that across to them that if you understand the geometry of the court, that hasn't changed in well over 100 years. Court's exactly the same size. Physics haven't changed since forever. The way the racket acts on the right. ball, the way the right. ball spins, the way the ball bounces, right. that's constant. Right. That's never going right. to change. The way the game's played is changing a little bit. Sure, the players are getting right. stronger and faster. They're hitting the ball harder. The equipment's changed. But basically, the game is exactly the same as it has always been. So right. there are things that you can learn off the court or just by watching. I say, just sit down and watch yep. this match right. and see what right. you can pick out. Same thing you right. talk about, sit and listen. If you don't understand something, that's okay. All this, Correct. you know, the thousands of pages of, of notes that you've put out to us, there's no way we can learn all that. But if we just sit and listen, listen to music, listen to Monk play, right. listen to Miles Davis, listen right. to, I was listening right. to Stan Getz the other right. night. And you know, it's just, there's always something you can learn without actually having to, to play, without having to hit a ball or get on the court. Um that, that session, I think I sent you the video about that, just basic backyard skills you can do with a racket and a ball. You don't have to have a court. You don't have to have a partner. You don't have to have a, um, anything, just right. racket and ball skills. Right. Really, right. really important. So right. that's, that's one of the, the most basic things I can, I can say. And then it's just keep things simple. Keep, keep your focus on, on what's important, what's right what you really have to do. Yeah, and right. I, I know I, I right. put down a couple of notes about, um, uh, what was I talking about? Um, just, oh, to, to improvisation, limit your choices to increase your creativity. That's right. And That's you've exactly been right. a what, big, big uh, focus on that. You know, improvise on two notes. Improvise on one note. Right. Well, I do the same thing with a, one of my favorite drills with the players is to get one player on the baseline, one at the net. I feed the ball to the baseline player. He has to hit a passing shot. He's got to get it past the net player, but he can only hit to certain parts of the court. He's not able to there hit everywhere. Go. He can only hit to that right. spot or this spot. And he's got to be creative right. with the way he hits the ball or right. she hits the ball. Right. They, right. they have to be able to think their way through that without... Uh, having you know tons and tons of options, and it's the same thing with right. with music. Right. And I'm, I really love that. That's it, it. It's made a big difference yeah. in in the way that I play, the way that I, I approach things. But I'm hoping with tennis players, it's right. the same same thing. You don't have infinite right. choices when you are on a tennis court. Right. You can only hit a ball in certain right. places. You're limited by the right. court. The net gets in the way. You know, where, where are you going to put the ball? So, yeah, right. You know, you've got to be able to think yeah, your way you, through you that. Know, right. You know, it's interesting because that word's limitations, right? <clears throat> we, uh, it's amazing to me how many musicians fail to realize there's limits. Uh, and I would think that in, in the professional athletic world hmm. and in tennis, uh, as you just said, there's limits, right? And until we understand that limits does not mean uh anything's lacking it it doesn't mean that you cannot be creative or um uh uh, successful playing because of limitations it's just the opposite and and if we don't understand the limitations then what happens is mentally everything is way too confusing and you know you've heard me you've heard me say this Mm -hmm. before in the past too that you know, if music, and I, and I would assume the same thing for tennis, we could just take the word music out of this sentence and slide tennis, uh, t- tennis into it, that I, I say all the time, if, if music is easy upstairs, if music is easy here, 
then you have a chance, you have a shot at being successful downstairs in your hands. If music, on the other hand, mm -hmm. is complicated upstairs, then I can guarantee you, you have no shot downstairs in your hands. And I would assume that the same could be said for tennis. If tennis is simple here, then you got a shot with the racket in your hand. You actually have a shot. But if tennis is complicated up here in the head, in your mind, then good luck with that racket in your hand. You're going to need a big racket because uh, the chances <laughs> are you're not going to be very successful. Am I, am, I, am I stepping out way too far on a limb there? Not, not at all. That's, that's exactly – I try to get players to – to again limit their choices keep it as simple as possible right. and understand that if if you can hit uh, there's a great old american tennis coach vic braden who used to say learn how to hit the same old boring shot every time and you'll always be a winner oh, right. so you just right have to learn to not get complicated right you know if i'm if i'm on the court and i've got a choice of a shot um, i just play the shot that i know i can play Right. And if my opponent picks it up and gets it back, too good. Right. That's just the way it is. But I only have one, I only have one thing in my mind, I only have one shot to, right. to worry about. Right. Instead of trying to approach the ball with, oh gosh, if I hit it here or hit it there, or, or maybe I can th maybe he'll think I'm gonna hit there. It's no, right. you're done. That's right. right. You just cannot cannot play. Right. Yeah. So I you know, I'm always uh I'm just always amazed at the similarities between the discipline that is needed to become an accomplished musician, how those same disciplines apply uh, to anyone wanting to become an accomplished athlete. I I'm always amazed at just how much of an overlap uh, the disciplines are. It's, it's fascinating. So hmm. you already have, you already have built into your DNA being a professional athlete and a professional coach. You already have built into your DNA that which is needed uh, to become a very accomplished and successful uh, musician. So, you know, with that in mind, I want to kind of shift the conversation a little bit to the music side of things. So share a little bit with the jazz mm -hmm. piano skills listeners about your jazz journey. Uh, be, if you would be candid enough just to kind of share with everybody, you know, how you practice how you approach things uh, at the piano, how you approach things away from the piano, what, what, have, what has been the most frustrating aspect of studying jazz and studying piano, jazz piano? What, what are things that you found that have come very natural or very comfortable for you? Can, I know that's a lot to, to cover, but if you could kind of just speak openly about those various aspects of your journey. Well, compa <laughs> comparing jazz piano with classical piano, it's, it is a nightmare. It really is. Uh, I didn't realize how much <laughs> I didn't know. That, and that's probably my, that's, that's as honest as I can be. There is so much that I've, right. just in the last two years, there's so much that I've learned. And look, I've, I've listened to, to jazz for, years and years and years and years and I, I i love it i love to listen to it and i listen to, to right. players play and think you know this is this is great uh this this must be really easy it's not because you start <laughs> to get into i know there are only 12 tones and i know it's not limitless right. but it feels like it sometimes but what i'm doing now is really getting back to basics of things like progressions, two, five, one, three, six, two, five, ones, right. really working on those building up from, from the, the shells to the three note to two handed voicings, even some rootless voicings. I, I, I mean, I love Bill Evans. So right. you, you've got to throw some of those in as well. Right. Right. But I have started to do a, a lot more away from the piano work with Good. just writing down okay what's this progression what's what's the fifth right. of the key of b what's the the sixth right. of e flat what right. and, and you put that out on the the master class a few weeks ago with the 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 little flashcard ideas 
of fill in the blanks and, and do this away from the piano. That was, right. that was so good. And it's something that I really have to do. Mm -hmm. uh, look, I can read me. I, I sit down and read the music and I'll play it, but I want to be able to do that and get in the middle of a piece and still be able to keep going. I mean, one of my, my big my horrible story when I was young, I was playing classical stuff, playing in a, in a, a recital, playing Liszt Hungarian Rhapsody. I got in the middle of it. And I got stuck. I, I couldn't remember. I just could not remember it. I didn't have the music. Right. <laughs> and I got stuck and I played it. I, I, no, I went back two measures. Oh, let's try it again. Oh, it was so frustrating. Nearly walked off. But somehow I got through it. But that's what I love about jazz. I can, I can actually make those mistakes and they sound, as long as I make them two times in a row, it sounds okay. <laughs> so. Right. Oh, that's great. Oh. Yeah, but uh, but that's oh, that's man. really so, is my oh. my goal right now is to be comfortable enough with enough of the changes, enough of the the rhythms. I know we're getting to the rhythmic patterns now, and that's that's a very very right. important part. And luckily, I I can feel that right. a little bit easier. That's it's not something I have to right, to count out all the time because I I did that. My my yeah. teacher in France was was adamant about, about counting and, and getting the time right. And right. playing Debussy, right. if you don't get right. the rhythm right, it just, it sounds horrible. So she was, she was very big Correct. on that. Right. Um, so yeah. that's, that's really, uh, I, I need to do a lot more work away from the piano and, and get the, the things in my head. As you say, if they're clear in my head, it'll come out in the fingers. It, it really does. Yeah. Yeah. Well, yes, you know, that that is so important. And, and you're right. I do stress that a lot. Right. The study of the study of music away from the instrument and, and the things that you that you've mentioned that you're doing is absolutely uh, gigantic. It's monumental. Right. Understanding keys, you know, being able to spell your scales, being mm -hmm. able to identify the chords that are produced by the scale, being able to spell those chords being able to understand the function of those chords that, oh, that's the two chord, that's the five chord, that's the one chord. Mm -hmm. the, the, that's like, you, you know, that's so, that's foundational type information that the reality is, the reality is this. Uh, if that is not, if you do not have a command of that data, if you do not have a command of that data, then it really is irrelevant how much technique you have, how much skill you have physically on the instrument. But if you do not have the command of that data, you will never, ever develop into a jazz pianist. That's just, those are just brutal mm -hmm. facts, right? That's, uh, there's no, there's no shortcut, right? There's no, you know, learn how to play jazz piano in 30 days, learn, you know, le you know, play your first gig <laughs> in 90 days. I mean, I, I you know, there's none of this shortcut stuff, even though that a lot of times people fall for that, thinking that there's a shortcut. But like like my dad always used to say, there's no longer there's no longer way to get anywhere than a shortcut. You know, so, uh, you know, <laughs> if, if, if everybody looks for that magic, that magic sentence or that magic pill or that magic wand or that, you know, that shortcut that's going to save them you know years of practicing but I, the, but the reality of it is it's just not there right i mean and i think i think i speak yeah. for all of us we've all tried to find it but it ain't there right it's just not there <laughs> well you can get to the point where sure you can play the notes you can play the tunes that's fine uh, but uh, it it just we're going to do that anyway. And what, what I, I really enjoy about what we're doing now with the, the uh, progressions of, of the, the lessons, if you look at face value of, of what you're, you're putting out there, it's very complicated. It's very technical. It's very academic. Right. It's, but then all of right. a sudden, boom, there's a tune. And guess what? All that stuff we've been working on fits into the tune. Hey, this is good. Because right. in in the end, right. that's what we want to do. Yeah. We want to play. We want to play music. We want to play tunes. But we want to play music. You know, if I just want to yeah. read music and play, 
play out of a book. I can do that. That's that's fine. But this this goes that next yeah. level, really, really more important. I think uh, it's like like on the tennis court. Yeah. First thing I look at one well, of the players: can he or she move? What's what's the movement like? I don't care about hitting a ball. Anybody, I can teach somebody to hit a shot in five minutes. That's that's easy. Mm-hmm. As long as you stand there, you don't move, and I feed the ball to you exactly in the right spot. I'll teach you how to hit that right. ball. And there are a lot of players who, who right. do that. But you move them away three or four steps, and the ball starts to bounce a bit higher or lower out to the side, and, and a bit of spin, and right. you have to adapt. You can't do it. They, they just fall apart. So right. the basics have to be right. there, and you've got to understand right. the, the basics, like understand the functions, understand the chord progressions, understand the, the differences in the keys and how they, how they work in tunes. Yeah. Um, that's why yeah. I said yesterday about, about giant yeah, steps. You know, you've, because... got, you've got keys running all over the place. <laughs> right, right. But, you know, you know, that's interesting because if they're – if you were gonna if you're gonna label anything a shortcut, the I- irony is the shortcut would be the grunt work, all the grunt work that we're doing, right? All the grunt work of the keys and the, mm. the chord scale relationships. Because you know, I tell students, I tell students that start with me all the time. Like if if a new student was coming into my studio tomorrow, here, here Dave, David, here would be one of the very first things I would say to them. I say, okay, there's two ways we can approach this. We could, I, I, I could teach you the way, uh, I could take the, the path where we're going to work on a lot of, do a lot of grunt work, a lot, a lot of grunt work for a significant amount of time. And at the end of that grunt hmm. work, you're going to be able to play thousands of tunes. That's approach one. Approach two, tell me what song you want to learn. And we can poke around on that song for about six months and uh, see how well mm-hmm. it goes. Or uh, we can poke around on it till you get tired. How about that? We'll poke around on it till you get tired of that song and you want to try to try your hand at another song. And we can do that, and we can flounder around that way for as many years as you're willing to pay me tuition and, uh, and, uh, and, and see how that goes. So <laughs> which, which appro- that's approach B. So do you want approach A or do you want approach B? Because that's really what it comes down to. If you do the grunt work, because the grunt work is found in all the tunes, the skills are found in all the tunes. So if you're learning the skills that are in all the tunes, then you'll be able to play all the tunes. But if you want to just work and, you know, flounder around on a piece of music, trying to put pieces of a puzzle together, we can go that route, too. But it's just not going to have the same benefit. So. But but that's but that's the real yeah. that's the choice that lies before you or before anybody wanting to study jazz yeah. piano. That really is the choice. O- option A, option B, pick it and we'll go. And you know the funny thing is you learn that one tune, spend months and months, and then a year later you've forgotten it. You can't play it. <laughs> yeah, so you can't play it. What right? happens then? <laughs> yeah, what well, well we go back, we pick another tune. <laughs> right. Yep. Oh, my oh gosh. God. I've got a You're repertoire right, of know. six tunes that I can play, and it took me 12 years to learn them. No. <laughs> no, that's, but it, it is the same with, with the tennis players. I, I, you know, they want to go out and play. They want, to, they want to go out and hit balls. And I see the kids do this all the time. They, they go out, and in almost right. every case, if I, if I turn four, bo- four kids loose on the tennis court with, with balls and rackets, they will go to the baseline and they'll start whacking balls back and forth. Every second or third ball goes in the net or in the fence or over the fence, and they waste all their time just because they think they want to play. And I say, no, just move in closer, <laughs> hit the shortest, softest shot you can hit, and hit 100 of those. So in three minutes, they'll hit dozens and dozens of balls, and they get their feel, they start to move better, they get their focus, they, the attention's better, and then they right. can start to move back right. and move back and move back. But you can't go out and play right. a, a full match the first first thing up. You just don't have the skills to do it. So I mean, it'll well, look like tennis, it, sort of, but not really. Yeah. Ah, uh, uh, that there, there you're, you're saying so many good things there, David. 
first of all, you, you mentioned the word skills. You said you got to know the skills of tennis if you're going to mm-hmm. want to be able to play the tennis game, right? The, the game of tennis. You got to know the, the skills. Yep. Or, or you can just you can do things that kind of look like tennis, but it's not really tennis. Hmm. And, and, and the same thing and the same thing happens in music as well. You got to learn the skills in order to play the game of music. And if you don't if you don't learn the That's skills right. in order to play the games of music, then you're putzing around on the on the on your instrument with with things that kind of sound like music, but it's not. Hmm. No, that the, there's a big difference there, and that's uh, I, I just think it's so important to to get back to basics and learn that, learn the fundamentals, know what you have to do to build on it. Because if you don't have the base, you can't build anything. It just it just yeah, all falls right. apart, and it, yeah. it proves itself very quickly. You know, if you if yeah. you're trying to I don't know run. Uh, a big scale or, or or playing 17 chords in a row and changing if you don't if you don't know them uh, yeah you can hunt and peck and, and figure out a way to to get there but it's it's going to sound terrible yeah. and the the rhythm and this is what has got me over the past few weeks is just the the rhythm and the how important that is to to feel yeah. the music so and and tennis is the same way there's a rhythm to the game that you, There's a rhythm. It, it, it right. makes it easier. Hmm. Yeah. Yeah, that's, yeah, that's, it, that, uh, you know, that's really interesting. You know, they're, they're, yeah. Yeah, that's, that's, that's interesting that you bring that up because uh, th- there absolutely is a rhythm to any athletic game, right? There's a rhythm to tennis. There's a rhythm hmm. to it. And, and that rhythm that we've been studying uh, this year in jazz piano skills uh, and been exploring in the master classes every week. The, y- we, we've gotten to the point where we realize, at least I hope we've gotten to the point where we realize that everybody that's uh, studying and, and kind of going on the journey with us this year, that, you know, uh, n- n- notes by themselves ha- have no excitement. There's no excitement. There's no musical note that's exciting mm-hmm. to me. Not one. You could play all 12 of them. That, that none of them do anything for me. So if you place that the middle C for me, it does nothing. It does nothing for me. Play D flat, it does nothing for me. D nothing. E flat nothing. In fact, it's just all blah 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 blah, right? But as soon as you start adding rhythm, you start adding rhythm to those blah 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 notes. Now we got something. Now we have something. And of course, mm-hmm. I always use Duke Ellington C jam C jam blues as as a validation to this point. That, you know, here's two yeah. notes, you know, the note G and the note C. Nothing special about those two blah notes, right? But look what Duke Ellington does with those two notes. Yeah. <laughs> Pretty cool. Mm. Right? So, well, it's like you know, Coleman Hawkins' one note samba. Yeah, yeah, right. 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 So I would imagine in the tennis world, I would imagine in the tennis world, if, if an athlete in the tennis world would really stop focusing on trying to make the great shot and actually would focus more on learning the rhythm of the game and how to control and manage the rhythm of the game, I bet they would be a lot more successful on the court than always trying to hit the great shot. Yeah, yeah. Uh, you look at you look at great players and they just look – they look good. They look smooth. They they don't force anything. Same with pianists. Right. I mean, you right. watch. Right. I mean, we talk about Oscar all the time, but oh yeah, you can't. You you've got to have the 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 ability to play like that. But uh, it looks easy and it looks, it looks smooth. Oh, one right. of the um, when I was I was coaching at the the National Tennis Center, uh, the, the Harlem Globetrotters were playing across the road. One night, and one of them came in one day. Said, oh, can I have can I, anybody here was for a hit? It, wait a minute now. Is this the Harlem Globetrotters with Metal Lark, Lemon, and Curly? No, no, no. That's when I was a little kid. No, this, this is. Oh. Uh, no, there were. Because that's the, this that's was the, the next Harlem... generation. This would have been okay. Well, you know, yeah, to know. me, that's the Harlem Globetrotters. I know. And, 
Yeah, and red clots and the Washington generals and yeah, I know. Yeah, right. Um, no, this was. Uh, uh, <laughs> no, this was. It was okay. a good crew. Uh, it would have been nineteen. Oh, what? Eighty nine, something like that. Okay, um, way past. Now. Anyway, one of them came into the pro shop one day and said, "Oh, can I can I have a hit?" So we went out on one of the stadium courts, and I I, I was hitting with him, and but just to watch him move around the court. He was about six foot eight, so he could cover the whole court in one step. But there was nothing forced. There was nothing uh, un, unbalanced. And he wasn't a tennis player, but all he had to do was get to the ball. And right. he sort of knew what to do with it. But that was, that was, was a perfect example of, of yeah. a good athlete who can, who can do something because he has the skills. He's got the, the movement, the balance, and all right. of that. Right. Uh, and it was... Um, no, it was, it was great fun, and right. and then the, the best thing was that he said, "Come over to the game tonight, and we'll uh, we'll catch up afterwards." And I went down to the locker room afterwards, and we had a, an eighteen month old son at the time, and he said, "Here, j- this is for your son for when he grows up." Handed me a pair of his autographed basketball shoes. <laughs> Everybody in the team had autographed them, and <laughs> I've got those hanging on the wall now. They're they're no, it's it's been great. So. Uh, but what I was thinking was the yeah. the, the fun, things that go through the mind when you're playing music or playing sports or anything like that. One of my favorite books of all time is The Inner Game of Tennis, Timothy Galway. Oh, right. Who talks right. about right. the uh, self one and self two. Self one, the conscious mind gets in the way all the time. You make a mistake. You idiot. Why don't you? Why can't you play? And he says, the answer to that is because you're no good. So you don't listen to that. You listen to self too, which is the unconscious. Just let it happen. The body knows what to do and it it will get the job done. However, and he was he was speaking at a national tennis teachers conference that I went to in New York one year. And he's the fallacy people think is that they read the book and they all you got to do is is just let it happen. That it, it it's all in there. He said no, it's not. You still have to have fundamentals. You've still got to have the skills, right? But then once you do that, you let those go, and you don't try to force anything. So very similar to Kenny Werner with his effortless mastery, and well, it's it is right. it is almost well, almost identical. Yes, right. Well, you know, just like what you just said, let it happen, right? But if you don't have it, you can't let it happen. There's no it to let happen. That's right. Right in the it. And the it is the are are the skills that we're talking about the skills of tennis or the skills of hmm. music, right? If you don't have the it, what what you can't let it happen if you don't have it, you know. Um, now yeah. that book that you mentioned, the the inner game of tennis, you know that was a uh, that was a big book, right? I mean that was that was a very popular book, oh. not only for tennis players, but you know um, uh, that I remember in in college I had to read that. That was required reading for musicians. In fact, there was another book called The Inner hmm. Game of Music that came that came out after that. That's right. But everybody said, you know, don't read The Inner Game. Read The Inner Game of Tennis. E- even as musicians, we were told to read The Inner Game of Tennis. Because, you know, because. Hmm. And the funny thing we was. Were talking about to, yeah, this is what we were yeah. talking about today is because the overlap is so what? It's it's like the same. Yeah. And the interesting thing is it, it, it's not a, a technical instruction book. There's very little technical instruction about how to play the game. It's all about getting out of your own way, understanding what you can do. And, you know, he throws in a few right. technical tips, things like on volleys, you know, get down a bit lower or whatever. Or um, you, you spend time watching the ball as it spins. So you work on your focus and you work on... Uh, Right. appreciation of what the ball's going to do and where it is and what it's going to do in space. Sort of the same thing when, when we're playing piano and you just, you just feel the fingers and the, and the fingering gets right and it just feels right. Yeah. And you don't, you don't have to force yeah. yourself to do it, but you get to the point where right. that becomes automatic. And that's, yeah. I mean, I suppose that's, well, that's what I'm trying to get to right now is, is yeah. Right. Yeah. Well, you've heard me, David, You've heard me say this many times. I, I say it in podcasts and, 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 you know, we've discussed this in master classes. You know, I always say that 
<clears throat> you know, I, I always say, I ask students when they want to study music, they say they want to study music, and I always ask the question, well, that's wonderful. You know, so what is, I say, that if you want to study music, please tell me, what is music the study of? If you want to study music, what is music the study of? And of course, they become speechless right away because they don't know, they don't know how to answer the question, what music is the study of? They, they want to study it, but they can't mm. tell me what it's the study of, which I find to be very interesting, right? So I, I'm quick. I'm quick to point out that music is not the study of dots and buttons. It is not that where, you know, you're looking at a piece of music, that <laughs> dot means push that button, that dot means push that button, right? I say, no, professional musicians mm -hmm. play shapes and sounds. That's what we play, shapes and sounds. So in essence, then we have to study the shapes and sounds of music. And I would imagine that in the tennis mm. world, as a tennis coach, there are the shapes and sounds of tennis, the moves, the motions, the feel of tennis, the same kind of thing, right, that you have to study as, a, as an athlete, as a professional tennis player, if you're going to have success. Well, we do. We talk about shaping shots. If you're, if you're hitting a serve, you want to hit it to a certain spot, it has to have a, a certain amount of spin or it has to go to a certain place. You shape a forehand or a backhand so that it, one, it clears the net. There's only two objects in right. uh, tennis is very similar to, to music. We, we go up and down in music. We've got scales and arpeggios. In tennis, you only have two objectives. You've got to get the ball over the net and make it land in the court. That's all you've got to do. <laughs> if you can do that, then we start to learn... We start to work on more spin, more speed, more direction, yeah. Yeah. A, a little bit of variety. But the game, the game itself is pretty simple when you, when you think about it. And I even I'll go back to, to Pete Sampras all the time. He won 14 Grand Slam singles titles by hitting a ball deep cross court, back and forth, back and forth, till he got a short ball, go to the net, hit a volley, win the point, game, set, and match. <laughs> pretty simple. Pretty simple. Um, <laughs> Right. And you and you look at the best players and they they do, you know, they are incredible now. I, I've got to admit it. They're right. they're just uh, they're right. great players. Right. But, the, you know, I think Rod Laver one time said something about, you know, you don't need to hit a fifty thousand dollar shot when a 50 cent shot will win it. <laughs> so you don't have to get complicated. Right. Um, right. Yeah. You know, you I, know would, I would I would. And you mentioned this. Yes. You met. Yeah. Go ahead. Go ahead. No, I, I was going to say. No, you, you mentioned would... this the other day that uh, jazz players abhor silence. They they don't they don't want to have nothing going on. So we, oh, we got to stick right. more notes in here. Miss, stick more notes in. No, you don't. Right. No, no you make don't. It, make it right. simple. Make it simple. Right. Right. You know, uh, it's funny. I imagine that you could say to a young tennis player if you wanted to. Right. This would be I, I guess this would be a really bad business plan in tennis as a tennis coach to say to them on their first lesson. Listen, <clears throat> when you can hit that ball over the net 300 times in a row without missing, then come back for lesson two. Right. That, that would probably mm -hmm. be a bad business plan, it, just like in music. It would be a bad business plan for me to say, look, when you can play your 12 major scales up and down the piano one octave and your arpeggios up and down one octave, then come back for lesson two, right? Because my point being is, <laughs> my point being is, is there's a lot of skill that you gotta, there's a lot of skill that's needed to do that. Yeah. Right. But if you take that, take that player and say, you gotta hit the ball back and forth 300 times, but put him two meters away from the net and hit the ball softly, that we'll do that. We'll do that. We used to hit, you know, hundreds and right. hundreds of shots right. in a row. Right. But right. you've you. It's like skiing. You can't go down a black run if you're not a good skier. You right. just totally lose control. You can't go beyond your control. Same right. with same with piano. We can't. I I cannot play. Uh, you know, a, a Chopin uh, sonata. Uh, well, right. almost anything. I, I play a lot of Chopin, but that's. Uh, there's some things that I just physically cannot play. It, it's yeah. just not possible. So right. 
Uh, that's right. that's just well, you the, know, the fact of the matter. And same thing with with tennis. Right, right. You know, it's 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 always fascinating to me to listen to uh, jazz musicians as they age, as they age, as they get older. You know, physically, physically, they can't do what they did when they were younger. I mean, there's a reality to that. But they end up playing better mm. as they get older. They they don't have the physical skill that they used to have. But their musical skill is by far much more superior, right? So there's yeah. there's something to be said. Sa- there's something to be said about that, right? And so if we could play, well, if they, we could play, if we could play old young, that would be fantastic. Yeah. I remember I heard I heard Earl Hines uh, in Washington one year at Blues Alley, and he would have been very old at that time. But, you know, and this is a guy who'd been around with Louis Armstrong in the 1920s, 1930s. Right, uh, right. Just a, amazing pianist. But right. still, still playing really, really well. You're, you're right. Some, some of them don't play all that well. We had McCoy Tyner out here a couple of years ago, and he wasn't well and, and wasn't playing all that well. So it, it is sad sometimes. But yeah. they still... Yeah. You can still feel it. They, they, they've got the feeling for it. And that's, yeah, uh, it's re- much I better. Remember, Believe me, it's much better watching old. Yeah. Yeah, I remember. Much I remember better watching old, on, old pianists. Yeah. 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 Well, Go I ahead. remember one time on, on the John, uh, Johnny Carson show, they had UB Blake come on and he was celebrating like his 90th mm. birthday or, or, or his 95th birthday, something like that. And I think he lived to be like 96 years old or, but, but anyway, he was in his nineties and he had a big birthday celebration and, and the curtain opened up and they helped him out to the piano. I mean, he was old. He was, had a walker. They, they get him out to the piano. He sits down and he plays a little solo version of, uh, I can't give you anything but love. And of course this is a 90 year old man mm. sitting at the piano, uh, sitting at the piano playing and he played it so beautifully. And he wasn't doing anything fancy, not because he didn't want to do anything fancy. Physically, he was 90 plus years old. Right. So he played. Mm. He played within the confines of his ability. And um, I remember after he got done playing a huge standing ovation from the band, huge standing ovation from the audience. Johnny Carson was on his feet. Heck, I was on my feet sitting in my living room watching. It was it was fantastic. It was absolutely beautiful. And, <laughs> and, 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 and there's a great lesson. There's a great lesson there for all of us, right? Mm. Right. And yeah. I think that and I think that lesson. Although I, it I think is that lesson. Yeah. Well, I, I think that lesson is that we, regardless of where each of us are in our own abilities right now, regardless of our age, with the abilities that we have we can make really nice music. We can make really mm. nice music. Yeah, it is, it is one of the benefits of, of musicians. As they get older, they, they just limit what they can do, and that, that's fine. They'll still sound fine. I can't say the same about old tennis players. So, right. so, some of yeah. them, it, it really is. Uh, but they've been, they've been through so much over their lives, and they, they put their bodies through all sorts well, that's, of, of tortures and yeah traveling the world can, and and playing right. and every day it's it does take its toll so yeah. that's a total body thing and and it's it, it is sad sometimes to see some of them play but uh, but some of them are, are still still playing okay yeah. that's i mean i'm shooting for the 80 and over wimbledon championships that's that's my yeah good yeah, do they in tennis? Do they? No. You know, like I know, I know in golf they have like the seniors tour. Uh, in golf, do they have the hmm. same kind of thing in tennis, like a seniors, uh, a seniors division in they tennis? Do. Oh, okay. Yeah. yeah, they do, and and uh, it, for the most part, it's pretty good. Um, McEnroe started that a few years ago. He was he was one of the the key players. Jimmy Connors played for a little bit. Borg still plays a little bit. Um, uh, we're waiting for Roger Federer to show up on the senior tour and just wipe everybody away. But <laughs> right, right, right. <laughs> and he will. Oh he my. will. One leg, he'll do it. Yeah. Uh, right. But no, they, they do play. They do play, and it's it's interesting. But it's not. 
it's not the way they used to play. That's that's the thing. So right. they're they're more right. limited right. than than a musician, I think. Right, for sure, for sure. Well, listen, my friend, we've been yakking for an hour now, man. So uh, we're gonna wrap this thing up. I cannot begin <laughs> to tell you. I cannot. I cannot begin to tell you what a joy it has been to sit here and learn about your musical journey, classical and jazz, your your professional tennis uh, journey as well, and how you're actually drawing strength from both of those disciplines to uh, help each one of those disciplines. It's it's fascinating, and I think it's a great lesson for all of us to, to take the heart as well. So, you know, on behalf of all the Jazz Piano Skills listeners, on behalf of myself, David, I want to thank you for just taking the time out of your day and sharing yourself with the community. It's, it's been a joy. Bob, thank you so much for what you do and what you do for everyone. I, I know all of us in the classes, all of us around the world, we really enjoy what you do. And, and hopefully we will make you proud one of these days and we'll, we'll actually well, learn some things. So well, it'll never you, end. You're, you're, <laughs> yeah, you you all you already do, my friend. You already make me proud. So, David, thank you so much, and <laughs> and we'll, we're gonna have you back. I'm gonna have you back on again soon, man. This been this has been way too uh, too oh. short of time. So we'll, we'll have to do a part two here soon. Well, I'm gonna I'll have to dream up some more stories. Then I'll have to go back through my diaries <laughs> and see what I've got. <laughs> <laughs> all right, David. Listen, man. Have a have a great weekend, and uh, I will see you. I will see you online at Jazz Piano Skills. You will. I've got to get back to the back to the books and, and study for this week. So, uh, and I can't All wait right. to see what tune you're going to come up with this week. <laughs> <laughs> me, me too. Me too. <laughs> All right. Thank you, David. Thanks, Bob.